And the mountain is here mentioned as Horeb, but actually it's Sinai. It's amazing. It was up there, probably the same place where Moses was sitting there watching God's finger writing on those tables. Writing on the stone. And he was up there to meet God. And he probably thought that God would be in all these big nuclear events. Nuclear explosions. I mean, I'm laughing sometimes. People are going, I mean, some people are, are trying to find the, the Noah's Ark, and which is, you know, a legitimate thing. Although I don't think God is, God is an antiquarian trying to keep, you know, old relics in the mountains of Ark. But if you want to find really a, a something of God's presence, you should probably go to Mount Sinai. If, if that describes the way I think it's a nuclear explosion there, I think you can still find radiation, radioactivity up there on Mount Sinai. And it will stick for much longer than, than something made of wood. Okay, but anyway, this is my scientific uh, conjectures. <clears throat> Just a few miles from here, what is now East Houston, eastern, the eastern part of Houston, about 150 years ago, well, actually more than that, 170 years ago, 180 years ago, a, a very large force of Mexicans was defeated by a very small force of Texans. Not Americans, but Texans. Okay. Amazingly enough, they were defeated. They, they almost didn't shoot back. Although, probably the Texans were outnumbered by... Uh, the most conservative estimate was, is three to one, but most most realistically, they were probably outnumbered six to one. Mexicans the Mexicans surrendered. It was a very quick battle. It is called the Battle of San Jacinto River, and this is how Texas was uh, born. Okay. What's more interesting to me at this point is how did they succeed to defeat a much bigger force? And this is not in the mountains. You don't have a place that is kind of, uh, you know, small, and you don't have a mountain pass. You don't have a, a, some, some kind of a valley in the mountains where it's much easier to defend them. It's, it's open ground. It's flat. This is Texas for ground. <laughs> it is flat. You know, how did they manage to defeat them? There was psychology involved in it. And that, that was, uh, the Mexicans believed all but that Texas is, is defeated. Okay, the Texans are defeated. Just the day before, they had seen all the all the members of the Texas legislature of the new Texas legislature of the of the, the assembly leaving by boats to uh, to Galveston. It seemed like there is no more force to be uh, uh, to be accounted for. Nobody else to fight anymore. And suddenly, early in the morning, they see this group of people. They cannot count them. This group of people coming against them and shooting and fighting as if they're just starting the war. When the Mexicans were thinking the war is over, on the other side people are fighting as if it just started. Okay? And they surrendered. They didn't even count how many people were against them. If they did, they would probably defeat them. But there was psychology involved in the battle. In fact, anybody who's been in the fight <clears throat> In his, in his life, or anybody who watched movies with fights in them, will know that this is a very, uh, a very interesting part of the type of a fighter's uh, psychology. That is the toughest moment in the fight, when you put everything in that, every last ounce of, of force into that final blow, into that final punch, to, 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 uh, to, to get them off their feet, and they're on the ground, and you're thinking you have won the battle, and you've got nothing else left in you because you just gave every single ounce of force into hitting that guy on the ground and he jumps back on his feet and says alright let's get this over with and you're like uh, Gandalf right at that bridge sitting there, oh man and I have no power left anymore to fight him. 
This is what Elijah was in the beginning of this chapter. He had just come from a great victory where he put all his power into it. He believed the thing, the thing is over. The war for God is over in this country. What I did right now is kill 400 of these type of prophets and 400 of another type of prophets. 800 prophets of Baal and Asherah were killed. I have won the war. Just, just, just put yourself in his place. He was sitting there in front of the people of Israel. He was about, he was, he was facing danger himself because if he couldn't do what he said he was going to do, it was his head that it would have been on that stump there and the people of Israel would have killed him and he had nobody to, 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 to protect him. Okay? Humanly speaking, he was alone against 800 prophets and the nation of Israel if he failed. So he put every ounce of his power, every ounce of his faith into, into it, and he won. <clears throat> he was like Rocky's opponent putting this last ounce, bam, and, and, and Rocky's on the ground, and, and, and the guy says, you know, I'm the winner. And Rocky comes back to his feet and says, may the gods do to me and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Jezebel was a master psychologist. She knew very well, right now, when he's so elated with his victory, I need to do something to bring him down to earth. And he will be spared. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. And Jezebel said, Oh men, my reign is over. I have nothing else left. My gods have been defeated. Jezebel actually didn't believe in those gods. Elijah made the mistake probably to believe that she was devoted to her gods as he was devoted to his gods. No, Jezebel was a statist. All she was devoted to was her power. She believed in her power over people, and she only used those gods and used those prophets as instruments for her. Jezebel was Washington, D.C. twenty-five hundred years ago or more. She only looked at the gods, but she was the Republican Party, if you will, the Democrat Party. She only looked at the gods as an instrument of her power. Well, the instrument is broken. What is the next thing a government, a, a government a ruler does? Well, if I can't use propaganda, what's the next best thing? Raw power. Raw power. That's what they do all the time. Eventually, if you destroy their instruments of propaganda, the next thing they do is power is supported by who's got by the bigger gun. If you got the bigger gun, and you win. <clears throat> okay, so she sends him a messenger and she says, Well, so may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And Elijah, the man who just killed 800 of her prophets, was afraid. She was a master psychologist. She knew what was going to happen to this guy. Right at the moment of his victory, his triumph, and she tells him, I'm coming to you. I'm not running away from you. I'm coming to you. This means nothing that you killed 800 of my master propagandists. It doesn't matter that you killed my media. It doesn't matter that you just exposed all my journalists and all my CNNs and so on as liars. I'm coming to you with IRS. 
<laughs> and he was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day journey into the wilderness. Now he goes all the way to the wilderness. Now he's running away from the place that he was supposed to take over because he just killed all their prophets. He's now going to the wilderness. All the way where there's no people. There's, I mean, he was just, he just showed Israel that he was prophet of the true God. And now he's running because of one message. And he's saying, there's no way that I can win against this woman. After she's been defeated, she comes back on her feet like the beast who comes back up again. And I cannot defeat her. Because he is like that raucous opponent, or like those Mexicans at San Jacinto. What happened to, to this? I thought I had won the battle. And then he goes there and he requested that he might die. He requested he might die. I mean, come on. He's running from her for his life. And he is so scared and irrational that he says, You know, I'm running for my life. Let me die. <laughs> I don't know what, I mean, if this is not an irrational person, I don't know what an irrational person is. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Well, if you if you were really serious about this, why didn't you stay back? <laughs> and you would have had what you wanted. Jezebel would have taken care of this as she promised. So obviously the guy's becoming irrational because she is not about helping him. It's, it's not about actually just destroying him. She's about making him complete moron in the face of everybody and in the face of God and so on. The idea is destroying him as a person. She's a statist. This is the situation actually that happened to Christ's apostles. Right in the face of the greatest victory ever, what he told them, the Son of Man should be exalted, will be exalted above the earth will be lift, lifted above the earth to save everybody. And they saw him exalted on, the, on that cross. The promise of the Old Testament, the promise of his own words, that he will be there on the mountain for the whole world to see him with the signs and with the wonders and with the sky going dark and, uh, and, and everything happening the way he promised that telling them this is going to be your victory they fled they were like Elijah they fled he told Peter you will betray me tonight even though you know who I am and Peter said me? <laughs> no way and the next thing he does is he turns around and says, I don't know the guy. And they fled. This is what happens to all of us. Right when we think we have victory, a visible victory, God allows the enemy to play his psychology card on us and tell us, you lose. So that we believe him. This has been the story of the American church for the last 100 years. For the last 100 years, right when we had one victory, the enemy turns around and tells us, I'm coming after you. And we suddenly forget that we have had victories in the past. And we start complaining about the fact that the world is going worse and worse, and worse, and worse. We've had victories with the homeschool movement, and then something happens in some court somewhere in Tennessee, or in uh, Washington State, or anywhere, and suddenly we forget the whole history of the homeschool movement up to now, and we
we start killing each other, things are hopeless, and publish all this stuff, this is what the judge said, this is what this judge did, this is what this judge said, and it's getting worse and worse and worse for homeschooling in America. Because just when we believe everything is okay, the enemy comes around and says, so may the gods do to me and even more if I don't make your life miserable, homeschoolers. And we think the world is coming to an end. Ever since the 60s, the lowest point, of, actually the highest point for gun, gun control and the lowest point for people of liberty, it was the 60s. Things are getting better and better for, for us who love liberty. And yet one thing happens somewhere, and what do we do? The next thing we do is we start publishing on Facebook how they're coming to grab our guns. <laughs> We publish stuff after, I mean, we just, we just, we're just eager to find all these little proofs that the world is coming to an end. All these little proofs that they're going to come after us, that they're going to start persecuting us, that they're going to make a, uh, they're going to make a mess of us, that we're going to be cannon fodder for everybody, even though the enemy is running out of resources, the enemy is running out of false prophets, the enemy is running out of his CNNs and, and his MSNBCs or whatever they are, even though the internet has given us the greatest power ever to actually overcome the power of the false prophets out there, and we're actually beating them in their own games today, and we still use that power to do what? To discourage each other and say, we have been defeated today. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. God, take our lives. <clears throat> and it is exactly in that situation when Jesus comes back to us and gives us His great commission. If you want to title this chapter here, chapter 19 in 1 Kings 19, and if I want to title this sermon, it will be Elijah's great commission. It is exactly in that situation where God plays the same trick to his enemy. And just when his enemy thinks that he has won the war, God raises his people up and say, go play the same trick back to them. Play as if nothing has happened. As if you've never received a threatening message. As if there has never been a judge in Tennessee or in Washington State. As if there has never been a decision by any court anywhere about gun control. And go back and tell them, we're back here. Let's get back to the arena. Before that, God had to play a game on Elijah. And Elijah went to Horeb went to Mount, Mount Sinai. It's the safest place out there. It's the church for crying out loud. Let's, 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 let's just shut down ourselves in the church, in the cave. Okay? We know it's a holy ground. You're never going to touch this because this is where God uses all his, all his arsenal. He uses the, uh, thunderbolts and he uses lightning bolts and, and he uses everything. There's the wind and there's nobody's going to touch us here in the church. The problem is, one person is going to touch us there, and it's not going to be fun, and it's going to be God Himself. And the way He's going to touch us is, what are you doing here? Elijah went to the, to the holiest place that he could think of. The place where God gave the Ten Commandments. The same place Moses was sitting there for 40 days. And remember, 40 days is mentioned here. God gave him food to eat, and it was enough for him for 40 days to go to Mount Sinai. So Elijah thought about it. I'm, a, you know, I'm not eating for 40 days. I'm like Moses up here. Nobody's going to touch me. I'm now untouchable. I'm now, uh, uh, I'm now completely... Uh, completely invincible up here on the mountain where Moses was because God is here. He, he wrote his law here. This is a holy ground. Nobody's going to come and touch me. And God says, what are you doing here? I don't need people in my holiest place. 
I'm okay here. There's nothing here for you to do. And Elijah starts complaining. Well, I was down there, but you know what happened? You know, these people have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, killed thy prophets with a sword. <laughs> he just killed their prophets with a sword. <laughs> He's whining about them killing them. Come on, it's it's it. You you just did that, you did that to them. And, uh, and I alone am left. He's just whining about it. And they seek my life to take it away. And God said, okay, well let me let me show you something. It's gonna be just for a short time. But it's gonna teach you their love. But he stands on the mountain before the Lord, and the Lord was passing by. He stands on the mountain. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. I mean, you think tornadoes are bad. <laughs> Tornado don't break rocks. This was breaking rocks. Okay, it rained the mountains. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the earth and, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle whispering. It says blowing here, but the word in Hebrew actually can mean whispering. A sound of gentle whispering. And God was telling him, This is what I can do. But this is what I prefer to do with the sound of gentle whispering. I'm going to talk to you. And Elijah was standing there, looking at all these great events, these nuclear explosions around him, rocks, the mountains around him, and so on. And Elijah heard it, and he wrapped his face with his mantle, went on, and stood in the entrance of the cave. He suddenly realized this, when God starts talking to you, That's where God's power is. He is right now going to give you the great commission. When you've been scared out of your wits, when you're reduced to a scared animal, then God says, okay, you're the instrument for me. But you're not going to be standing here because you're going to be hearing that question from me and it's going to be, and the more I say it, the more I ask you that question, the more threatening my voice will be. What are you doing here? Because i got a job for you. <clears throat> and he says, I have been very, and, and, and then he says, uh, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Again, he's whining about it. Torn down thine altars and kill thy prophets with a sword, and, alone, and I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Here God ignores all the whining. You think Christian counseling is supposed to be, you just understand the person, I mean, you kind of try to get into their shoes, and you kind of try to uh, be compassionate, to commiserate with them, you know, uh, give them a shoulder to, you know, to, to, to shed a few tears on, you know, and, and so on, you know, you always have uh, 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 tissues ready for them and so on. Well, maybe it's a human way, God's way is, all right, we got work to do. Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. There is no comforting here. There's no comforting voice. And remember, the gentle whispering was not comforting. Elijah, who was watching the whole nuclear explosion thing, when he heard the gentle whispering, that was not comforting. That was, whoa! The blow's coming. <clears throat> And he said, go return in your way to the wilderness.
wilderness of Damascus. And when you shall have arrived, I want you to do this. All power and authority has been given to me, and you've got to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything whatsoever I have commanded to you. I don't care if you're scared. I don't care if, if somebody else is a better psychologist than you. I don't care what messages you receive from women in power. I want you to go back there and you've got a work to do and your work is to appoint kings. Psychologically, this is a man who's running for his life. He is on a mountain just whining about the fact that somebody wants to take his life and God is telling him, go back and you got to appoint kings. We're not going to start from the bottom. We're not going to start rebuilding your self-esteem. We're not going to start rebuilding your self-confidence. We're not going to start doing that. I don't care about your self-esteem. I don't care about your self-confidence. you got to go back and appoint kings. So let's start from, the, from, from where, where I want you. Okay? And he says, the next thing he says is, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel king over Syria. That's a pagan king. The first thing he says is start with appointing a pagan king. You see that? All right, the next thing he says, and then Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. It, it's, it's bad enough that it's a pagan king. Now he says that you go to Israel and anoint somebody, a king of Israel, while your arch enemy is there and she's a queen of that same place of Israel. She just scared the daylights out of you and you ran up here to the mountain, but we exp I expect you to go back and reply to her exactly in the same psychological way, using the same psychological trick on her, when she thought, I finally got rid of this guy, he's been not, he's been not seen for 40 days, we know he ran to Israel, to Judah, uh, and he left his servant there, he must be in the wilderness somewhere, we don't know where he is, but you go back, and just when she thinks, she got the victory, you play the same trick on her and say, this is going to be the king and this is what's going to, what, what he's going to do to you. Let me translate this. What he is saying is, every time there is a judge who is doing something, who, who, who uh, passes a verdict against homeschooling, you got to come back and say, this is what we're going to do to this judge, and God is going to do this to this judge, and we're going to continue the fight. And if we don't like that judge, that judge is facing a serious trouble, and that's got to come out of the prophet's mouth, and that's got to come out of the pulpit. Every time IRS says, you, uh, you either stop talking about politics or we take away your IRS, uh, a 501c3 status or whatever, a pastor must come up, show this letter and say, this is what I say. You're not taking my, away my status and I'm not because you don't have the right to do that and I'm not shutting up. But I will appoint somebody else that will actually deal away with you, IRS, and you'll be out of the game, and we'll be still here. Every time a judge or anybody in any party does something to either increase the debt or try to grab our guns away or whatever like this, the church must come up and say, we just came back from Mount Sinai. And we got a message for you. We're anointing another king. Yeah. And by the way, before that, we'll get allies, if necessary, among the pagans. But you're in trouble. Every time something like this happens, the church must respond immediately with a message much, much stronger In complete defiance 
of what the king says. Openly define what the government says and say, no. No matter what you try to do, we will double our efforts and we'll strike back. And amazingly, after he says, you shall anoint a king over the pagans and a king over the Jews. And then he finishes with, and you shall anoint Elisha. Who's Elisha? Who's Elisha? I mean, Hezekiel was a high official in Syria. Jehu was a military commander in Israel. But who? Who's that guy, Elisha? Why is that so important to anoint him, the prophet? Why is this part of the whole thing? And we see, and he says, in the matter of judgment, this is what's going to happen. You have a lower level of judgment. It shall come about. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, it is expected that Hazel is going to use his sword to do God's justice. It's a pagan king, anointed by a Christian prophet. It's expected that he will use his sword to do God's justice. But if he doesn't do if, if he doesn't do it completely, we got the next level, and this is going to be the Christian king. Whoever escapes from the sword of the pagan king is gonna run into the sword of the Christian king. And when he escapes the sword of that Christian king, the highest level of human justice will be the sword of the prophet, Elisha. We appeal for justice to pagan kings as a church. And we tell people, if that king doesn't do the justice very well, we'll have Christian kings over him. And at the end, if he escaped from there, the church is expecting you for dinner. Buy you hospitality. Alligators are expecting you for dinner. <clears throat> Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal in every mouth that has not kissed him. And that's the very, and the very interesting thing at the end is who is this Elisha? We ask that question. Who is this guy who is supposed to be the ultimate authority? And here's a lot of symbolism in this. Who is this guy who is the ultimate judicial authority in the, in the scheme that God showed Elijah about his judgment? In, in, the, in the structure of judgment in the human society at the time. Who is this Elisha guy that nobody knows about? I mean, who is he over? Why is he given the power of judgment? I mean, we, we know one guy is an official, the other guy is a military commander, but who is this unknown guy and what is his power? What is his realm? What is his, uh, uh, what is his kingdom that gives him the, the authority to be the final judge in human affairs? <clears throat> and he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat. And he was put in power over something. But his power was economic. He was your economic, little people, middle class, having 12 pairs of oxen and ruling over them. All he was commanding is he had dominion over the earth. He had the economic dominion over the earth. He was not a military commander. He was not a government official. He was not a king. He was you. You know what an acre is, right? An acre. 43 something thousand square, foot, square feet, right? You know what acre, where acre came from? Why do we have acres? I mean, why do we in, today in America measure by acres? It's a very ancient, actually, measurement. And in fact, it is in the Bible. Why do we have acres? 
acre is exactly the amount of land that one pair of oxen, one yoke, can plow in one day. Twelve acres in medieval England, in Christian medieval England, twelve acres was the symbolic piece of land given to nobility as a sign of goodwill from the king, as a sign of a, of a franchise over a certain area. There were 12 <laughs> acres of land as a symbol of the fact that that noble, that, that baron, rules over everybody else in this area. It was a very small piece of land compared to, you know, the bigger, uh, the, the, the bigger areas that they were given. That was the symbolic piece. Ruling over 12 yoke of oxen meant you're ruling over the earth. Meant you have the lordship over the earth. You have dominion over the earth in England. In many places, if you read the Doomsday Book, which is, is kind of an economic, economic, uh, 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 inventory of all the properties in England at the time, you will see there that the 12 acres are mentioned many times. That meant that the guy is a lord over that specific area. He had 12 acres there. Now it's, he had more than 12 acres, but the 12 acres were the sign that he actually owned the land. Everybody else. He was the lord. Okay. And here we see, and that came actually from ancient times. And here we see Elisha Ruling over how many yokes of oxen? Twelve yokes of, uh, uh, yokes of oxen. In fact, you can also think about it as he was the twelve, it was a symbolic um, prophecy to the twelve apostles, twelve disciples. And we see later on, I mean, throughout the whole Bible, the word twelve is actually the word of completeness. We see that that prophet that came, that was the final, ju the final justice, the final authority of, of judgment over the earth, below God, of course, because God is the one who said anoint him, was the guy who was the guy experienced in having economic dominion over the earth. It was you. who have the final authority to be judges. Not the pagan kings, not even the Christian kings. So anything that escapes from them must meet you before it meets God. What he was saying here is that the final authority on the earth will have to be in the hands of those people that take righteous dominion over the earth. Otherwise, it makes no sense to give us this little detail that Elisha was plowing with 12 oxen and he was riding on the 12th. <clears throat> Elisha, of course, is not sure. Hey, wait, 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 wait. I got my family. I got everything else. Let me, let me go kiss my father and my mother. Because that's normal. I, I got, I got past. I need to be. I need to go at least say goodbye to my past before I enter the future you're promising me. The same thing that some people told Jesus. Let me go bury my father and my mother. Let me go. Let me go make good with my brother. Let me. Let me go make sure my family is okay and so on, which is not bad in itself. But Elijah says, "It's up to you, man." I'm leaving, I'm leaving this place in a short time, and you've got to decide pretty quick. You don't have the time to you don't have the time for both. And the next thing he does, Elisha does the right thing. He sacrifices his oxen. Not that he gives up gives up his dominion over the planet. But he admits, he symbolically admits that his dominion is under God. And everything is God, and his dominion is under God, and it belongs to God. 
It doesn't say he went back to kiss, kiss his father and his mother. It says he sacrificed his past. And arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. There is a lot of past that we have. And that past is there to train, was there to train us in the skills necessary to take dominion and therefore be the final justices, human justices on the earth below that. But that past is supposed to be sacrificed the moment the call is issued. Because there's a future for us. So let's forget our fears. Let's forget all the psychological tricks of the enemy. Let's forget everything that keeps us tied to anything that is not our call before God. Let us not trust our ingrained pessimism about the future. Let's not look at this judge and that judge or this media or that media. We have to stand firm and stand firm means not stand in the sanctuary, not be shut down in the church and not get out of it, Mount Sinai, but go out there and our job is start appointing kings. And unless we start appointing kings, we're not going to see a better future for our children. Amen. What do we do now? Uh, John's going to pray for us. We'll close one more time. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the message that Brother Bojar uh, brought to us. We pray that you would bless each one of us in, as individuals and families and, and taking that message and applying it to our lives as we go out into the world this week. God, as he, as he, as he spoke to us, let us, let us leave our, our past behind and our insecurities and our fears. Let, us all, let it always be at the forefront of our mind that the victory is already yours. The, the, the winner of the war is already decided. All that's left is to fight the battles on a daily basis.